Welcome everybody to Empowerment Point TV. With us tonight, I have the very lovely Jemima Hutton from Dyslexia Demystified. Now, Jemima has a really amazing story and not only is her story amazing, but she helps children, she helps adults, she helps teachers and she helps schools to for so children can shine in what they do because children are amazing and I find that I hear that children are lazy or you know they don't want to work or they don't want to do anything and they start to lose their confidence they start to feel worthless and many of these kids also have dyslexia and when we find out what they have and we can actually help them they find that their worthiness comes back and you know they actually feel proud of what they do and they feel proud of who they are so I wanted to interview tonight Jemima and to help other people with dyslexia as well. So welcome Jemima. Thank you so much for having me Debbie, I really appreciate it. That is my absolute pleasure. Now I just need to tell you there might be a lag and if there's a bit of a lag I do apologise. The internet has been playing up all day which is really weird because it usually doesn't. Also, uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask us, put it in the comments because I will be looking at any questions, any comments live as well. And Jemima is, she has dyslexia, she's starting to be a doctor and she's an amazing human being. Jemima, tell us a little bit of your story. Um, so thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so I guess first and foremost, I am dyslexic. Um, I was diagnosed actually when I was 15, so quite late in the picture. Um, and, and I've always known I was dyslexic my whole life. Um, my, both of my parents are actually in education and, and have been for a long time. And my father is, of course, dyslexic as well. We know dyslexic is um, hereditary or has a hereditary oh. component to it. Okay. Um, and so we're thinking that I inherited it from him. In our family, we like to say it's the gift that keeps on giving through generations, dyslexia. Um, so I ended up um, sort of growing up without a diagnosis um, and that was the choice of my parents um, because they wanted me to focus I think predominantly on my strengths and for a long time I was really really disengaged with my schooling um, it you know obviously didn't appeal to me it showed me all of my weaknesses all at once and I think you know a lot of the time with dyslexia we think oh it's an issue with you know English and, and reading writing and spelling skills but it affects so many other areas of schooling as well um, and so schooling you know was a really intimidating task for me um, right up until sort of year 10 was when I started to engage back with it but up until that point I was very very um, keenly interested in sport and I was a national swimmer and water polo player for oh, wow. most of my young life um, and spent my time training uh, you know sort of 10 times a week um, up until the end point so um, when I was about 16 I guess I turned around and I decided right I think I've pushed out this decision as far as I can um, in terms of what I want to do in the future. And, you know, school has certainly started talking to us about, you know, entry, entry pathways into university and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, I grew up on a farm um, and hopefully not too many of you find this a creepy fact, um, but my parents being the educators that they were thought, wow, what a great learning opportunity when animals pass away on the farm we'll do some dissection and actually, you know, learn about the biology of animals, um, which, you know, in hindsight probably was a bit of an oh &S issue, but um, we ended up, you know, developing a really keen interest, my sister and I, in, in biological sciences. And so I thought, great, you know, at age 16, I thought, fantastic, I'm going to be a nurse. You know, it involves helping people, it's doing good work, um, you know, good, honest profession and an interest in health sciences. That's what I'm going to do. And my parents, you know, not tiger parents by any means, but they challenged me on that perception because they thought rightly so that I had sort of pegged myself, you know, not that nursing is a, is a disrespectful profession at all. It's a fantastic profession and I'm actually training to be a midwife at the moment. Um, but I had such an interest in the physiology and the, and the underlying causes of conditions that they said, Jemima, I think you actually want to be a doctor. Um, what, what would you think about going for medicine? And I sort of turned around and I was like, are you guys crazy? You know, I've, I've been, you know, a pretty average student my whole life. I, uh, I was working incredibly hard to be average and I was exhausted um, yeah. just trying to be average. Um, but they thought, hey, I think your persistence skills and your resilience that you've developed through your through your swimming, um, you know, is translatable. 
And so I basically committed myself for the next two years, for year 11 and 12, focusing on my schooling. I dropped all my sport, which wasn't a great idea at the time, but dropped all my sport and focused entirely on my studies. Um, and that didn't mean that I was knuckling down and, and doing a whole lot of tutoring or anything like that. I just really focused on how I learned best. And also the, um, you know, some of the assistive technologies out there and the supports available um, to help me learn. And sure enough, by the end of year 12, uh, and a lot of hard work went into those two years, but by the end, I ended up actually achieving my goal and getting into medicine. Um, so I'm coming to you from Brisbane at the moment. <laughs> um, and I, I currently study pre-medicine and midwifery up at UQ. Um, and I also run a business on the side. So um, I took a gap year in between um, year 12 and starting university. And I decided that actually the education system sort of did me a huge injustice in the way that, you know, I went to seven different schools. I don't think a single teacher picked up that I was actually dyslexic the whole way through uh, unless I told them. And, you know, there's not enough known uh, around education about dyslexia um, no, and not. what to do to help. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, stuff it. I'm going to be that person. I'm going to advocate for young people with dyslexia. Um, I'm a bit of a stubborn person, if you haven't gotten that already, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that most, you know that most amazing things and most successful businesses come from adversity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, they do. You know, you see a problem and very organically, I think I fell into business, um, as most people sort of do. And um, yeah, I just I just decided, you know, there's not a lot of support out there for young people. Um, you know, we have a lot of parent support groups. For those of you who don't know, there are a lot of parent support groups on Facebook out there for students with dyslexia. Um, there's a lot of, you know, teacher PD, staff PD and, and things that go on in education, but we leave young people out of these conversations all the time. And, you know, they're the conversations that are being had about us. Like you think we should be involved. Um, so I guess what I was all about was, you know, encouraging that autonomy and that self advocacy and that empowerment, um, in young people with dyslexia. Um, so that they can, you know, improve their self-esteem, as Debbie was saying before, and improve their confidence and their self-worth um, and ultimately lead successful lives in whatever that looks like for them. Yeah. Very, very true. Thank you for that. And I just want to backtrack a little bit. Um, you mentioned that your father has dyslexia. Did your parents realise that you had dyslexia or they didn't? They did. So my dad did. Um, dyslexia wasn't as well known back then, but my dad right. certainly noticed the same sort of behaviours in, in myself as a child. And having an older sister, it was very, very clear the disparity in um, learning behaviours between my sister and myself. Um, and, you know, I just wasn't picking up language as quickly. My verbal skills were so much better than, uh, you know, my written skills. It took me a long time to learn to write. I reversed a lot of my letters, um, all of those sort of classic signs. So I grew up knowing that I most likely had dyslexia, um, but I didn't get a, an actual official piece of paper until I was 15, which sort of hurt my confidence, I guess, in another way as well. How, how did it hurt your confidence? How did it feel growing up and not not having a, a an action plan i guess what you had as well and feeling that you know you weren't the same as everybody else how, how did all that make you feel yeah i guess for me i felt like a total fraud um i felt like um you know going into that test i don't think i've ever been more anxious for a test in all my life because going into that test i thought what if it comes out negative? You know, what if it comes out saying you're not dyslexic, you really are just stupid and dumb and lazy and all the things that you've been telling yourself for years, you know, and perhaps that other people have been subconsciously or consciously telling me as well. Um, and so for me to have a piece of paper was really important just so that, not so that I could use it as an excuse, but so that I could validate my struggles um, because, you know, it is a real struggle. And a lot of the time when I spend time with young people, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of me trying to convince them that, hey, this is a real thing. I know we can't see it a lot of the time, but this is a real struggle and a, and a scientifically proven difference in our brains. Yeah, yeah that's fair enough too. Um, I wanted to ask just for people who may not know, what exactly is dyslexia? 
Mm. So it, I think it comes from Greek or Latin or one of those terrible medical languages, um, but it basically means difficulty with words. So typically um, we have difficulties in reading, writing and spelling, but it also affects our executive functioning skills as well. So that's um, all the sort of things controlled by the frontal lobe. So organisation, for example, and planning skills are also affected. Um, the, the sort of the terminology around that to be sort of scientific about it is that we have trouble with our phonemic awareness um, and phonemes are literally just like the little sound groups that we have in words so for example st makes a st sound we have trouble decoding that in words and so when we learn to read we have trouble both decoding the words and also encoding the words which is to write them as well yeah fair enough thank you for that uh now, I was doing a bit of research and found that 20% uh, of the population have dyslexia. And that I read that one in two, one in 10 people who have dyslexia, they find it really, really hard to decode words as well. Tell yeah. me, yeah. so I think. Are there different types sorry. of dyslexia? No, sorry, sorry. Are there different types of dyslexia or how does that work? Yeah, so dyslexia is sort of the overarching term. Um, it's the group term, if you like. Under that is a whole lot of other conditions, or I don't really like to call them conditions because that's yeah. sort of a medicalized view of, uh, of the world, but um, you know, a whole lot of other neurodiversities, perhaps is a better word, um, which might be dysgraphia, for example. So still got the dis, uh, there's a lot of disses. Dysgraphia is um, trouble with handwriting. Um, there's oh, okay. dyspraxia, which is a difficulty with um, sort of motor coordination. Um, and it's dyscalculia as well, um, which is uh, basically dyslexia in numbers. Um, so more issues with mathematics. Um, and there's a whole lot of other sort of, you know, side conditions uh, to that as well. But um, dyslexia is most certainly the overarching term. And as you say, um, Debbie, about 20% of the population has what's called a specific learning difficulty, um, which is sort of an even broader group of those um, type of uh, sort of neurodiversities. And then under that, we've got about one in 10 with dyslexia. So dyslexia is the most common specific learning difficulty. Yeah. Okay. And what should parents or, and teachers actually look out for? Because, you know, they, they might have a child who who seems to be, le well, I'm not going to say, what, 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 what are the different signs that parents can look out for and teachers can look out for? I think this definitely is age dependent um, yeah. in terms of when you're picking it up, um, but certainly in, in those early years and in early primary, um, you know, uh, the vast disparity between verbal skills and written skills is is a key one. Um, you know, I have a lot of parents who come to me and they say, I know my kid's smart. And I'm like, I have no doubt that your kid is smart. Um, you know, they can explain to me, they can, you know, verbalize what they're thinking. They're so self-aware. But when it comes to writing a sentence, no clues. Um, and that's a really, really common thing is having that really clear discrepancy between, you know, perhaps their IQ or their verbal intelligence um, and their written work. Um, the other thing would be in those, you know, again, earlier years, primary, um, just they're taking longer than their peers to pick up um, the different sounds and, and what those letters, you know, which letters correspond to different sounds. They're just taking a, a bit of time to pick that up. Um, some kids do reverse le letters or, or write in mirror um, on okay. occasion. I, I always used to spell my J uh, facing the wrong way um, in, in my name. And, um, you know, so they might have issues in well formation yeah. yeah in the actual formation of the letters as well um and and really speed as well as the other thing you know really slow labored handwriting or um slow labored reading as well um and to be honest a lot of the time they won't want to read so if they're if you're finding it doesn't mean that they're not engaged in books i used to love having my mum read to me um, and my nan used to read to me until i was like 15 um but you know they don't want to read the book back to you, um, or don't, don't want, want to, to read it. They're scared yeah, of making exactly. mistakes. Exactly, they'll make a lot of. And you know what's yeah. really, yeah. It, it's funny how kids, that happens to kids and they're scared of making mistakes, but yet in the business world, we say that the only way you're going to learn is to make mistakes. And in life, the only way you're actually going to learn is to make mistakes. And they say, make you're going to make mistakes, make them fast, yeah. Yeah. But make them and then learn from them and then move forward fast. So yeah, very, very true. Mm. Now I just well, want to... It, oh, it's absolutely... 
Sorry. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Debbie, in the business world. I think the only exception to that is probably with dyslexia and reading because right. um, often, you know, I have parents who do often, you know, try and get their, their child to read aloud back to them. Um, but in some cases that can actually make it worse um, because if, if you think of it as um, the way that your brain stores memories of words, if that child is constantly reading out a word differently each time, and they're reading it out incorrectly each time they're storing you know multiple different versions of the incorrect version of that word um and so oh, wow. when they go to retrieve that word later they've now got six options to choose from than if mum or dad had have just read them the word in the first place where they'd only have one option you know the correct option to choose from so in that case um mistakes are sometimes not as good to make in those earlier years because we want to limit how many versions of that word that they're storing yeah. So just so I've got it right, so if a, if a child is reading to themselves, they're, they're reading the word the way they should be reading the word, but when they read it aloud, they could be reading it totally differently. Is that right? No, I'm, I'm not, no, not necessarily. So even if they're reading it to themselves, they might not be reading it incorrectly um, right. or correctly. Um, right. But what I'm saying is if they're reading aloud to their parent at night, often it's better if the parent just reads to them aloud or they use an audio book so that when they're attempting new words that they haven't seen before, they're, they're seeing the first correct version of the word first ah, okay. rather than okay. having um, a go at the word. So saying to your child, have a go and sound it out is perhaps not the best approach because now they've stored lots of different incorrect versions of the word. So when they're first approaching the word, we want them to have the correct version. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to check Facebook and see if we've got any comments or questions before we go on. Um, Fiona, go Debbie and Jemima. I think that might be your mum. <laughs> Fiona. <laughs> um, Thanks, mum. One supporter. <laughs> there's a, no, no, there's, there's one from your dad saying that he's listening as well. And that he's Wonderful. very... Thank you, parents. Is, and he says that he's so very proud of you and what you are doing to support others. So that's really lovely. Thank you, Peter. And we love that Jemima is doing what she does because she's able to help other people. And I think it's really important because really not... I, I don't think enough is known about it or whether it's known about it, enough is actually done to help children in regards to it as well. So, mm. so you know, going through what you've gone through and helping others the way you do has been a blessing for other people as well. <laughs> Your dad says he's here to embarrass you, but don't worry, it's all good. <laughs> it's all Absolutely. Good. They have succeeded. Lucky I put on foundation today, Dad, because you can't <laughs> see me blushing. Thank you very much. Oh, good. So what can parents do? Because first of all, it starts with parents and teachers. So what can parents do to, if they're noticing something different with their children or they're noticing that they're not learning as easily as someone else might, what can they do to help mm. their children? I think the first thing to do would be to speak to the school. You know, I think it's it's really easy for us, um, you know, I'm not a parent, but for parents to sort of um, speak up and, and sort of have a bit of a, a barrier with the school. But we want to collaborate with the school as much as possible before we have to fight them. You know, it shouldn't be this big fight with schools. We want to collaborate as much as possible. So speak to their classroom teacher or whoever is teaching them literacy. You know, ask them if there's anything that they've noticed going on or if they can keep a lookout for some of the behaviours that you've observed at home um, just so that they can keep an eye on things um, and you know you don't necessarily have to say hey I think I you know my child might have dyslexia but just say hey I've just noticed that you know Sammy is you know reversing his letters a bit or is you know taking a really long time to read he seems to be taking longer to learn to read than his peers like you know have you noticed any of this going on um, and that should spark enough of a conversation with the teacher to at least you know sort of tune them in um, to starting that process um, there is sort of a length of time in terms of the diagnosis process um, 
they won't diagnose anyone with dyslexia unless they've had six months of evidence-based intervention. So if that teacher has decided, yeah, there are a few unusual sort of things going on here, they might then look at implementing, you know, making sure that they've got an evidence-based intervention, which means a structured synthetic phonics program, right? So lots of big words. Basically, all it means is it's really explicit instructions in teaching um, students different sound groups in a specific order. Um, so they learn, you know, for example, I don't know what it is. It's not the ST words, but the ST words first, then the AI words, then these and these and these and these. Um, and each book that they learn that week corresponds to the sound that they've learned. So for instance, if they've learnt the word AT, like those sort of endings in cat, then they might read the book cat on the mat was flat, um, etc. So they need to make sure that they've got a structured synthetic phonics program in place and monitor that progress of that child for the next six months. So if they're not improving, mm, sorry, go ahead, Dave. It sounds like consistency is really important with it as well. Consistency, absolutely, and follow through. And most schools these days are using those kind of programs. Um, but you do have to have about a six month period of, of one of those programs to determine, okay, is this, you know, a developmental delay? Is it an issue just in their reading, writing and spelling? Is there a processing issue going on? Has there been anything else that might have disrupted their um, development of, of language? You know, have they um, had a hearing impairment? Is this English their second language? Those sort of things which might have impacted the situation as well. Um, and then after that, if all is sort of still looking like it could be dyslexia, um, they might recommend either seeing someone internally within the school or the teacher will recommend outside of the school in some sort of private, um, you know, private practice like spelled, for example. Um, so that's sort of the, the basic sort of diagnosis process. So is there a different way that teachers should talk to parents? So just say teachers have noticed something with a child because I have a number of teachers who also may be watching this as well or may watch the replay. With the a teacher, is it the same conversation they would have with a parent or how would they have the conversation with the parent? Often it's teachers having a conversation with the parent as well. So if the teachers picked up something in the classroom that they don't feel is quite right or that might be indicative of dyslexia, um, you know, often the parents are continuing the reading process at home. You know, they, they take home readers or, or things like that um, at the primary level. Um, and so when they take home those readers, you know, it's the job of the parent to kind of continue um, that learning process. So if the teacher's picking up on some of the things, they might first ask the parent, hey, have you noticed some of these things happening at home as well? Yeah. Um, and then if that's the case, making sure that, you know, the student's on the right program, um, also that they might be incorporating a lot of um, multi-sensory kind of approaches at home. So for example, um, making letters out of Play-Doh or making um, letters out of sticks or, um, you know, sandpaper, scratching into sandpaper, something like that, making sure that the students is engaged as they can be, um, but also without, you know, obviously hurting their self-esteem. So one thing I would be really, I guess, cautionary to teachers would be, you know, not to enforce these programs um, too severely on students you know they've still got to be kids they've still got to go out and have fun and go play with their friends and have social time um so they sh certainly shouldn't be you know having tutoring that early on and, and things like that it, it, unless it's necessary or the parent feels it's necessary um, but at the end of the day every decision is you know made by the parent on behalf of the child at that sort of age um, yeah. and so it's a discussion between the teacher and the parent as to what the next steps are in that process so the big thing here too is is don't make the child feel worthless that they're not. And usually they're quite highly intelligent as well and they can speak well, they can do things really well. It's just the learning and the reading which is which is quite difficult. So it's really important the way we make well, you know what, whether the child has a learning disability or not, it's really important the way we treat children and it's really important how we make children mm. feel as well. Because these kids, you know, they do have a slight learning difficulty, but they're amazing in every way. And if we can find ways of helping them mm. be better at what they do, then, you know, they're going to have a much, much better life as well. And your testament to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, your. Uh, and, um, and. Go on. Sorry. Oh. And, and kids, as you said before, Debbie, they're, they're hyper 
hyper aware, you know, kids know what adults are feeling as well. And um, another sort of cautionary to both teachers and parents would be, um, you know, your attitude towards this potential dyslexia or not dyslexia um, will really rub off on how your child will interpret that, you know, their potential 100%. dyslexia for the yeah. rest of their life. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're really resistant to it or you're really worried about it, they're going to be worried about it. Whereas if you treat it enough as, you know, Hey, this is just something that we're going to have to work on, but it's not, you know, a hundred percent of you. And we acknowledge you for your strengths and for what you're good at and for what you're passionate about. Um, then you're on the right road there. I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Now I don't usually say this, but I will. Jemima is 20 years old. And I only say her age because she mentors kids too. And we have, there'll, there'll probably be a number of children out there or, or teenagers or even adults. And Jemima is able to help out there as well because she's been through it. She's done it. And she's starting to be a, a midwife at the moment, which is amazing. Um, amazing that it's being a midwife. That would just be, you know, every, every day would be wonderful. So I just wanted to ask you too, what are some learning techniques that you found that really help? Oh, Debbie, that's like my entire business in, <laughs> in, in a sentence. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, for those who are wanting really specific advice, I I'd strongly urge you to have a look at our YouTube channel. We just finished a, a whole series on study bites um which is uh basically each episode is only about five minutes or so um and we present a really different way of learning but i guess the main thing um that i learnt was in terms of hacking my brain in a sense um was really tapping into my strengths and using my strengths to sort of combat my weaknesses so unfortunately in a lot of schooling these days we do have to rote learn a lot of concepts um you know or it might be memorizing definitions or new terminology and things like that and i guess the approach that I took was very much a Einstein theory of insanity. You know, if you do the same thing over and over you're, and expect a different result, you're insane. Um, and so anything that I, I felt wasn't working for me, I would just get rid of and do something differently. That was the only sort of approach that made sense. So in year, this is all in year 10, year 11 and year 12, you know, I found um, that textbooks, for, ex for example, weren't working for me. Um, I don't interpret well in written text. Um, for those of you who are wondering, I, I'm very severely dyslexic, actually. Um, I, it might not come off that way because I know that my, you know, my verbal skills are quite good. Um, but I, you know, my reading comprehension is the 16th percentile. So I'm literally better than 16% of the population. Um, and so reading textbooks for me just does not work as, as a form of learning. Um, and so instead, what I did was I switched to purely video and audio based um, input. So I would use Khan Academy or Crash Course or anything I could find on YouTube. Um, you know, that would help me learn in, in that different way and accessing the information in a different way. Um, the other thing I really noticed that wasn't working for me, which was a really tricky one, because I think we hold a lot of uh, value on this technique is note taking. Um, yeah. You know, you, you sit in a classroom and, and everyone's taking notes and you feel so much pressure to take notes because that's what everyone does to learn. Not for me. Note taking does not work for me. I, I would argue it doesn't work for the majority of kids. Um, it's too hard to be able to focus on what the teacher is saying, um, you know, that's not on the notes, what's on the PowerPoint, what's on my existing notes, making sure that what's on the board is exactly the same as what I've written on my page. Um, it's too much of a, a cognitive load for me to be able to actually complete that process and learn anything, let alone develop a question or participate in the conversation in the classroom. So what do you so, do? I got rid of it. I said, I'm not taking notes. I'm just going to sit back in my chair and, you know, take in the conversation, ask as many questions as I can and actually participate. Um, and I ended up either getting my notes off a teacher, if they're willing to give out notes to the class, I would get my notes from either a peer who was, you know, perhaps higher up in the class than me. So I had the best quality notes. Or I just wouldn't take notes altogether and I might record the lesson on my phone and hear it back as audio on three times speed. Um, and that was a far better way for me to go. Um, you know, even if I did take notes, to be honest, I threw them out most of the time because I was never going to go back and read them. So it just seemed like a crazy thing to do. But they were the main ones was, you know, harnessing assistive technology was a huge one. You know, utilizing speech to text and um, text to speech and, you know, getting rid of anything that really wasn't working. So we're really in a time at the moment which is better than any other time when it comes to technology. So we can record a class. Mm. 
or even Google have a way of it, when people are speaking to record that from uh, words to, to written words, from verbal words to written words. So there is technology that we're able to use at the moment that you know many many years ago we didn't have and we couldn't we couldn't utilize. So which is absolutely brilliant as well. So how do you you that's your studying techniques, which is fantastic. You mentioned your YouTube channel. What's what's the name of your YouTube channel? So it's just the name of my business, Dyslexia Demystified. Um, and the series under that is called the Study Bite series. Okay, thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people going on to that and having a look and, and looking at different ways of studying that actually helps them study better as well. Now you also get involved with the school as well. So how, do, how does that happen? How do you go about that? So for people yeah, with so exams and things like that that they've got on. Yeah, exactly. So um, I guess when we started out, our, our main service was offering school-based presentations, which we still do, but obviously that was a bit more of a pre-COVID uh, sort of time that we were doing that in. So we were getting into schools, we were running staff PDs um, from a student perspective. Um, we were running workshops and presentations for students and also running, um, you know, different workshops and presentations for parents as well and, and doing different events in, in rural communities um, for dyslexia. Wow. Um, and then after that, obviously COVID happened and everything, we started focusing a bit more on our mentoring program. Um, and a big aspect of our mentoring program is teaching students self-advocacy. And all that means is basically teaching students to stand up for themselves and their own needs. So obviously knowing themselves is, is a first critical step in that process, knowing themselves as learners and knowing what their needs are as learners in the classroom, but being able to facilitate those conversations with their teachers themselves from the student themselves um, so that they can ask for their needs and get those needs met. Um, the other thing that we work with schools on is, um, you know, helping students to get accommodations for exams. So um, just, before, you know, just before you go yeah. on, can you explain what accommodations are? Just before that, mm. I just want to let um, Lisa, if you're still watching, yeah, the replay will stay on so you can watch that afterwards as well. Just um, yeah, <laughs> just go on. Yeah, so accommodations are, um, so there's, there's, a very clear distinction that probably parents and, and teachers need to be aware of. There's, there's an accommodation and there's what's called a reasonable adjustment. Now, a reasonable adjustment takes place for uh, an individual with a, um, a, not a learning disability, but a intellectual disability. Um, and that might mean actually adjusting the content um, in that exam or that test um, or that assessment um, to meet the needs of that student. An accommodation um, doesn't change what's in the exam or the test or the assessment they're doing the same assessment but they're just doing it with um something extra or uh something in doing it in a different way i guess so for me for my accommodations for year 12 for example um i had extra time because my processing speed of written information is so low um so i had an extra 15 minutes per hour for every exam that i was writing um i got to have a laptop in my exam. Um, again, I'm doing the same test as everyone else, just typing it because I'm a faster typer than I am a writer. Yeah. Um, and I also had a separate room because I was, you know, I think at that age, we're all quite conscious of our peers. Um, and, you know, I didn't really want to look different to my peers. And also it was quite distracting having everyone walking in and out all the time um, when I was still going with my exam. And then the other thing that was really critical was having rest breaks. So I would um, have specific times where I would tell my examiner, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take a rest now. And I would get up and have a stretch, walk around um, and then go back to my test. So they're this type of accommodations that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. And I just want to go back for a moment when you said in regards to your studying, when you're doing exams and you have to do a written or a, a, an assignment you've got to hand in and they've mm -hmm. asked for a written assignment, how do you go about that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Look, to be honest, I think I'm still figuring it out for, from a uni perspective. Um, you know, it's funny, Debbie, sometimes I think to myself, God, maybe I'm not dyslexic. You know, I, sometimes I've hacked <laughs> the system so well, I think maybe it's not there anymore. Maybe I've been making it up this whole time. And then all I have to do is try and sit down and write a uni essay. And I'm like, no, nope, 
definitely still there. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a really, really tricky thing, essays. Yeah. It's very, very easy to hack reading as a dyslexic because you just turn on audio and you're mostly good to go. Um, but writing is a really, really difficult one. I use a lot of different assistive technologies to help me with that process. I think the main thing for writing those big essays is um, really breaking it down into manageable chunks because half the problem with writing as a dyslexic is uh, the emotional aspect of writing an essay for me it's still it makes my heart pound as soon as you said essay I just went woo my anxiety levels are through the roof it's intimidating it's you know humiliating to sit there in front of a blank screen and 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 watch that little flicker of the cursor not move for one word you know um, it, it it's really really difficult and so for me it's a lot about managing my anxiety but bringing it down into what can I do you know in five minutes what can I do what's my what's my you know first first step um, you know and it might be just writing the title um, you know breaking down into command words expanding on those command words in that essay question what do they mean making a mind map of you know all the yeah. concepts that, that 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 sparked in my head and then bringing it back to sort of a more linear um, concept of a plan you know really clearly dot pointing out you know my topic sentence my evidence you know what going looking at sources and bringing them all into it and actually I had a really um, really really productive meeting yesterday with um, some guys from Claro who some of you might know from the assistive technology space um, Claro has put together a whole lot of um, different programs uh, a Scotland based program um, but they uh, put together a whole lot of assistive technologies for text-to-speech mainly um, and a little bit of speech-to-text as well and they're coming up with an essay writing program which I'm just trialing at the moment and oh, wow. that basically cuts all of that down into really manageable little pieces that dyslexic students can go through systematically step by step um, but I think the other main thing with those sort of tasks is writing uh, in, in a non-traditional way so what I mean by that is um, you know, my mum, she's an English teacher, she'll love listening to this. Um, she used to try and teach me the teal structure, you know, going step by step. And for me, that, do, that actually doesn't work. Um, I need to go step by step, but I need to go in my own order. Um, so I write non-sequentially. So I might write, you know, I, I think of a really good idea on my plan for my third paragraph and I go, right, I'm going to write a bit of my third paragraph. And then halfway through, I might go, oh, no, no, not passionate about that anymore. I've sort of lost my train of thought. Might go and write my bit of my first paragraph. So I'll go and write a bit of that. Might come back to the third paragraph, write the second, write the fourth, you know, and then I stitch it all together at the end. And my mum thinks I'm nuts. Um, that, that's a crazy way of doing things, but that's the fastest way that I can get out my words um, because I'm trying to go with the flow as much as yeah. possible. Um, because for, for dyslexics, for writing, anything that disrupts the flow um, is, is just totally uh, gonna, di gonna disrupt our writing process entirely. So you might even think um, as, as a neurotypical individual that you know going and doing your research from Google and then just going and writing a bit in Word is quite neat easy process but for me as soon as I'm out of that word document it's like oh different process I'm you know different stimuli I'm just totally distracted so I have to have dual screens up at the same time so that I'm not actually changing my focus um, even little things like that mm. just to just to let you know that I don't know if it helps you as well and helps other people that on Google and I can send it to you as well they actually have a drop down you need to be logged into Google itself and you can actually uh, do it. So the sheet is open and whoever's talking, it, it writes everything of what they're actually saying on the Google yeah. Doc straight away. It doesn't work. So if I did it now and put it on, it would, it would uh, write everything I'm saying, but it wouldn't write. So it, yeah, works, yeah. it works from a teacher in a classroom perspective. Mm. But in some perspective, it doesn't work. So it's just another thing to look at as well, which is fantastic. Absolutely. It's yeah, and those those the, assistive technologies are, are so critical to to that writing process as well. You know, I read back my work to myself using um, text to speech so that I can pick up the punctuation. Because if I'm in my head for too long, I don't I don't punctuate my sentences as well. Um, whereas if I hear them read back to me, I can. And likewise, if I'm typing i'm not actually physically typing a lot of the time i'm dictating with my voice so word is writing it down for me mm. well done well done it's amazing how you found all these amazing little tricks and tips that work for you 
and that can work for <laughs> other people as well because it's not only children it's adults too who have not learnt the way to or easier ways to do things and they lose their 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 oomph as well exactly. and they start to feel worthless as well and they're not they're not at all so it's wonderful that you're finding all these different tips and different techniques and you're helping others with it too which is great i'm just going to find out if we have any other questions at all if anyone has any questions feel free to ask away and i'll ask jemima no no questions at the moment uh i just want to have a look if i have anything else that i want to ask um we seem to have gone through most of it are there three big tips that you can give firstly to parents <laughs> three big tips okay um i think the first tip would be to uh really take a strengths-based approach to your parenting style you know try and focus on your child's strengths as much as possible um, you know make sure that you know they're still doing their extracurricular activities they're still you know going out and having time to be a kid so that they're still having some sort of love of learning even if that's not in a classroom um, you know it's really important to foster that um, I think a lot of the time you know when we pull kids out for extra literacy support we think oh yeah we're doing the right thing you know um, we need to get them into more literacy so that they can better their literacy skills and for some kids that might work fantastically but if they're Amazon. pulling out of all of their all of their sports and the music and all the things that they love doing you know that that might impact them emotionally as well so it's weighing i'm not saying you know not do tutoring or not do those extra literacy, yeah. extra literacy programs but it's about weighing up um you know okay uh, how much is this going to benefit my child versus how much is this going to impact on their self-esteem and take away from their time and all that sort of stuff um i think the second thing would be don't be too afraid of assistive technologies. I think, um, you know, for some parents, they go, oh, well, I don't want my kid to become too reliant on assistive technologies too early on because they won't have that in the future. And the answer to that is they definitely will in the future. Um, you know, I think many years ago, we thought, uh, you know, teachers used to say, oh, well, you can't use a calculator because you what do you think you're going to be walking around with a calculator in your pocket and yes you will we all have one now you know and it's it's the same it's the same for for you know for dyslexic students um you know i can guarantee i i study medicine you know and, and midwifery arguably some of the hardest degrees out there um you know i run a business full time and i can guarantee you that in my daily life i don't think i would write more than a sentence in the traditional sense or read more than a sentence in the traditional sense you know what does it matter if i if i read with my ears and i write with my voice i'm still reading and writing i'm still functioning in this society um you know so it, it really doesn't matter as much all we need is a level of proficiency um you know in those traditional reading writing and spelling skills and then i think the other thing is you know just know that your kid can be successful you know this isn't a life sentence it's it's a lifelong uh struggle perhaps that they're going to have or, or a lifelong difficulty we know that dyslexia doesn't go away um but it's certainly something that you can cope with very very well there's a number of successful dyslexics out there as we know um you know and a number of different business richard, people and, and richard entrepreneurs. Branson's one of them Richard Branson, yep. you know, Einstein, Picasso, you know, Jess Watson, uh, Oprah, I think is even dyslexic, you know, lots of different oh, people out know. there. Um, <laughs> there you go. Have a Google, you know, have a Google with your child about, you know, who's out there. Um, and also, I guess the other thing is, you know, don't forget as a parent to pass on the reins, you know, and I know it's very easy for parents to get really fired up and advocate for their kids, which is awesome. That's what kids need, particularly in those early years is parents going into sort of, you know, make sure that their child is getting them the supports that they need, particularly in schools and, and things like that. But don't forget to pass on the baton, you know, don't forget to teach your child how to advocate for their own needs because they're going to be a person in the world one day that's going to have to do that within their, their work or their study. Um, and it's important to foster that relationship as much as possible. Mm. True, true. And three tips for teachers. Three tips for teachers. Um, actually, similar to the parents, to be honest, particularly don't be afraid of assistive technology. I think teachers are terrified of assistive technologies. Um, you know, they're, they're not that difficult these days. Um, and if you do need a bit of extra assistance, you know, 
take some initiative and go and do a PD or, hey, come and pay for a PD <laughs> with me, um, you know, a little plug. Um, you know, I'm happy to go through assistive technology and teach you the different apps that, that are out there. There's some amazing stuff um, out there now. It's gotten a lot better than, you know, the old dragon speak, which I don't want to put dragon down, but, you know, <laughs> it's gotten a lot better than that um, since then. I think the other thing is, um, you know, not being too hard on kids, um, which doesn't mean lowering expectations, but just, you know, get to know that kid, get to know their learning. Um, you know, are they more visual? Are they more kinesthetic? How do they engage the most in the classroom? Um, often, you know, just like six learn really well through conversation. We learn really well through contextual learning. So, um, you know, linking things to real life contexts. Um, if they're struggling with maths, you know, getting out the measuring cups for fractions and measuring out some flour. Or, make it fun. You know, make it fun. Exactly. You know, foster that love of learning. Don't make it a torturous task. Um, you know, and it'll be more fun for you too to come up with those creative um, sort of ideas. And it's, um, and it's yeah, true. go. It's true. Learning should be fun as well. You know, my background is in training, corporate and business training, and not every adult learns the same way. So we need to put different ways of mm. learning as a trainer in a business. Mm. We need to look at that in, in schools as well, because not everyone learns the exact same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. You go. <laughs> no, no, no. You go on. <laughs> um, I was trying to think of my last tip, but I think it, I think it would just be, you know, um, in terms of accommodations, you know, you have to be a fierce advocate for that, for that student if they can't advocate for themselves or if their parents, you know, don't feel that they can advocate for themselves. Um, you know, you have to be an advocate for that student if you have taken the time to, to get to know the to get to know that student and, and know how they learn best. You know, don't forget to pass that information on to the other teachers as well, because that's one of the worst things I think done in our schools is passing information from, you know, teacher to teacher, even from year to year, it doesn't get passed on. Um, and that could really, you know, set that kid up for the next, for the next year of learning. And, and you know, it, it just, you need to advocate for their needs as much as possible. If you think that there's something that might be going on that might be dyslexia, some of the things we've talked about before, you know, talk to the head of individual needs and say, hey, I've noticed a couple of these things. Um, do you think it's worth having a meeting with this child over? Um, so, you know, it, it's just about being an advocate for them. Yeah. It's the little things we do to help that can make such a big, big difference down the track as well, which is really exactly. important. Uh, and what are three tips that you have for teenagers? For teenagers? Um, yeah. I guess, first of all, is um, to, to educate yourself about dyslexia and much like the teachers, you know, get to know yourself as a learner that is the key to school and that's the original intended purpose of school is so that we can learn to learn it's not about you know learning the content it's about learning how you learn best and treat it like a game you know I, I treat it I treat my memory like a game a lot of the time I I was doing a pharmacology subject last year and I had to learn 90 different drugs and all not just their names but what they were used for and how they worked in the body and it was like the best game like I, I just had so much fun trying to make up little word pictures and mnemonics to remember that like foster that love of you know trying to hack your own brain you know how can you learn something faster than ever before um, you know figure out whether you're a particularly visual person or you're a particularly hands-on person or auditory person and get engaged with assistive technologies you know don't be afraid to stand out yeah. um, and most of the time like you know as a teenager I don't think you get this until you're an adult but not everyone's watching no one actually cares what you're doing except you they care more you about know? themselves than anyone exactly. else <laughs> everyone else is too preoccupied caring about you know what everyone else thinks of them that they <laughs> they're not thinking about you in the first place so please don't be scared to use assistive technologies just own it you know act confident no one will question you um if you are if you don't feel confident enough to kind of own you know using headphones or whatever in class or a laptop then ask for a separate room ask if you can work yeah. in another space quietly um during class time you know find discrete ways of using assistive technology or use assistive technology purely outside of class because even that will make a difference for your life and then i think the third thing is just have fun you know be a kid um have fun with your friends hang out you know do lots of co-curricular activities 
I would foster your strengths as much as possible. So if, if that's not in school, that doesn't matter. For me, I was really into public speaking and leadership and sport. And that's what I spent most of my young life doing because that's what I was good at. It built my sense of confidence, but I also had a lot more fun in the process than if I had been just hitting the books 24 seven. Um, you know, so make sure that you know what your strengths are and how those strengths go for it. You know, give yourself a good go um, and use your strengths for your weaknesses as well. Help out your weaknesses by using those strengths. Would you give that same advice to an adult with dyslexia as well? I think so. Yeah, I don't think it would change that much. I think with adults, I think there's possibly a little bit more forgiveness that they have to go through themselves and, and emotional mm. sort of um, recovery that you sort of have to do as an adult um, with dyslexia because, you know, you might have potentially been through a, a pretty different well, not a different education system. In fact, it's pretty much the same, my dad would argue. But, um, you know, you, you've probably had different attitudes from your teachers about dyslexia and different attitudes from your parents about dyslexia when you're growing up. So sometimes it's just about acknowledging that actually I do have something called dyslexia. You know, it's not my fault. Um, there are other people like me. I'm not alone in this world um, that's and that's it. okay. And I'm still, I can still be successful. I think that's a huge part of the emotional uh, sort of journey for adults with dyslexia. Um, but same sort of story, you know, don't be afraid of change, go out and learn how to use assistive technology, see how it can improve your productivity. You know, I do my emails through voice to text. It takes me like next to no time at all compared to if I was writing them, you know, by pure typing. So, um, you know, get out and educate yourself and find your, find your, um, tribe as well, you know, find some other dyslexic people, talk to them about what they do in their work life. Um, there's a lot of support out there for, adults with dyslexia if you're looking for it um, particularly in the employment space um, you know I know Shay over at Dear Dyslexic is doing a lot and Jay over at um, Thriving Now they do a lot with adults with dyslexia so if you're looking for some for some extra support um, that the supports are there. Mm. That's fantastic is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Oh so much I could talk about dyslexia <laughs> forever. <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, just if, if anyone is looking for some extra support or you want some more information, don't, you know, hesitate to contact me, preferably call me <laughs> um, or send me a voice message um, just because that's a lot more dyslexic friendly for me. But, uh, you know, always feel free to send me an email or a Facebook message. I will get back to it eventually um, and we can set up a chat at some point. But if you're looking for some extra support, you know, for your own young person or um, you want some you know, sort of parenting advice about some things, you know, that you're sort of struggling with in your journey with dyslexia with your young person, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, we're really happy to support you. And same with teachers, you know, if you've got some questions about some students that you have in your classes this year, or, you know, how your students are adjusting from online learning back into the normal classroom, feel free to send us an email and get in touch with us. No, that's fantastic. Now I'm just going to check if we have any questions at all. No, no questions, but we do have people Win. watching and we'll have people on the replay who'll be going, I wish I was there to ask those questions. <laughs> that's all right. Feel free um, to send them through. Send through so the that's questions. That's fine. Now, I just want to let people know, I actually have, uh, I, I was talking to somebody about someone I knew with dyslexia and they brought up Jemima's name, which was fantastic. So we got in touch, which is brilliant. So I could help other people who have dyslexia. And the one thing I found is that children, there are children out there who they do, they feel worthless. They feel like they're amazing kids. They're amazing, brainy, intelligent, lovely, loving children. But because they don't know exactly what's going on with themselves, they're feeling mm -hmm. worthless. They're feeling different to everybody else. Um, they're feeling like they just don't matter. And so with having a look at what dyslexia is, having a look at the different ways that we can actually help children and adults and teenagers with dyslexia, what we're doing is giving people their confidence back. And that to me is one of the most important things because once a person has their confidence back, they can shine, they can do so much in the world, but that's what we need to have a look at. So Jemima, thank you so much for coming on board tonight. I really appreciate it. Now, firstly, you have a YouTube channel called Dyslexia Dyslexia Demystified. Yeah. Demystified. Um, so please go on to the YouTube channel and have a look. And there are lots of little study bits there as well. The second way you can also, if you wanted to contact Jemima or you wanted Jemima's help with the parents, with teachers, with the school, 
Jemima is really happy to do that. She is building this little business. Well, it won't be little for long, but she's building this business because she could see that people needed help. And I was saying to her earlier that most, a lot of the most, well, most of the most successful businesses are come out of a need. So people go through adversity, they find a need out there and they want to help people to overcome that pain. So it's kudos to you, Jemima, for doing that. That's just absolutely amazing. Now, you, you also said that people can contact you by phone. What's the best phone number that you are happy to give out? Absolutely. Do you want them to contact me? I'm it's happy to give out happy, happy to give out my mobile 0405 333 um, or send me an email at which is just Jemima, J-E-M-I-M-A at Hutton H U W T O N dot education, the full word, and that's it. Fantastic. Again, Jemima, thank you for so much for what you do. We, I, I know you're in exams at the moment, so thank you so much for coming on board whilst you're doing exams. We <laughs> wish you all the very best in, uh, in your exams as well. And go, girl. I think you're doing an amazing, amazing job. You're helping other people at the same time, which is fantastic. So, guys, if you do want to get on to Jemima or you do have questions or you need some help or you're not sure, Jemima is so happy to answer any of your questions and to help you where she can. And I think she's amazing. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you so much, Debbie, for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. That is my absolute pleasure. So guys on Facebook who are watching, we're going to go now. So have a fantastic night. And again, any questions you have at all, the replay will be up so you can watch it. Or any questions you have at all, feel free to get in touch with Jemima or you can get in touch with me and I can get you in touch with Jemima as well. Thanks guys, I hope that's really helped a lot. And please, if you see children who you think that, you know, something might not be right with their learning, talk to them, find out because it might be dyslexia. And if you find out early, you can save them a lot of heartache as well. And guys, enjoy your night and have a great week. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.